good to go. And then she kept having severe pain. I have to give chicken. They're like, yeah, she did break her. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch and see if they like put themselves to bed. So like right in the middle of the day, or it's dark. Right, right. And you only extra the world, the world's coming to an end. Like it's okay. This is ridiculous. I gotta pay a thousand dollar bill. And they're like, no, we did the right thing. Appeal denied. All right, let me uh, pray and we'll we'll get started. Father, I just want to thank you for this morning that you've given us, uh, just a beautiful spring morning, and just pray that you bless our conversation and that we would honor you and, and just uh, grow our understanding of your grand design uh, within our bodies, Father, and I uh, pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, this month we're building on our continuous theme here, and uh, we're going to be focusing on the human body. So evidences for design within the human body, and there's a lot to talk about, so we're only going to scratch the surface on it. Uh, there is a great book, I'm actually still reading it, but it's Your Designed Body. Um, it's highly detailed, and um, it talks about how, so it's written by a medical doctor and a systems engineer, and they collaborated to talk about how the body has various things that are very similar to system engineering and things that engineers use regularly to solve problems, um, and we see these same kind of patterns all throughout the body. But, you know, before we get started, maybe... Um, I'll open it up a little bit and see what you guys like. What, what do you know about the human body and like what fascinates you by the human body? What um, it's gross. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. <laughs> yeah, working at a hospital is gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have a, a special perspective there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's probably the, mm. the fall, you know. Yeah. There are smells in there that you yeah. didn't know were in there. <laughs> it's funny. I think the fact that the that they're so, I mean, survival, right? We all have one. We all have a body, and it's there to maintain and sustain itself. And how so much of that is very delicate, and yet it functions with very little of our consciousness involved. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need to think about breathing, except we are up all now, um, blinking, all of that. We have to make sure that we put water in it, food in it, probably move it around every now and again, maintain somewhat of proper hygiene and the rest is completely automated. Um, and you would think with something so complex, there would be far more uh, purposeful usage of it. Like I think about a car, I think about, okay, this is where my brain just goes, Moo. there's so many things that we function with today in our daily lives that are extremely complex and we have to take really good care of them. I'm sure people that are like mechanical engineers um, taking care of like cars and other things. There's just so much that you have to do to maintain something so complex and yet our bodies do it by by themselves in a sense. I think that's what fascinates me. I don't know if there's anything else that doesn't. That like everything, like even in the areas that we've tried to make crossovers of like let's make a man-made thing with biological aspects, like yeah. even those break down. Yeah, so fast. And it's, mm -hmm. We just like haven't gotten past that where we can make it it almost would seem sort of like a form of like perpetual motion if yeah. we were able to really make that crossover of making machines, mm -hmm. so to speak, that can, you know, you put in like some food and water and they fix themselves mm -hmm. in a meaningful like way that does work. Yeah. Yeah. Everything requires our intervention to keep it functioning. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting point. It makes me think of like ones if you had to feed your phone, uh, that'd be weird. But you know, if it like, <laughs> you know, well, it's like you're the yeah. like the DeLorean, I mean, yeah, you plug it in, yeah. yeah, right, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, remember the better, okay, better off ten. Yeah. Remember they create a machine oh. that runs the building, 
and like it create it like got stressed and had heartburn and so like <laughs> acid was like eating through the walls and they were yeah. like oh no this is a bad idea yeah. and I'm like oh my gosh yes yeah I forgot about that <laughs> now you remembered yeah it's true no like our highest technology is nowhere close to being able to heal itself like we have some like meta materials that can sort of self heal um you know or like uh metals that when you heat them they'll come back to their original shape but you know nothing like the human body where you know we scratch ourselves or um whatnot and it just heals over time it's like it never happened but it's it, it's also interesting though that um i think like uh transplants um, skin grafting, things like that, you would think, like if you take um, if you take a car and a part of that car breaks down, um, like the muffler, let's say the muffler gets a hole in it, you could, in theory, get a muffler from another car and like finagle it a little bit to make it fit and it would probably function okay. I'm not a mechanic, so if you are and you're like, no, Chelsea, that's not true. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> but... Um, but you see in the medical world that when somebody gets a new heart that they've already had, and it's, it's the same functioning thing, there's rejection meds. Mm -hmm. You would think that replacing one functional, one not functioning part with a functioning part that is the exact same thing mm -hmm. wouldn't be so highly rejected, and yet it is because yeah. that tissue is what it needs, but it wasn't the same design tissue for that specific individual and so there's something there which i'm sure a doctor could say yep it's these things white blood cells da, 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 da. um that that person's body is saying that's not mine we can't use it but i'll die if we don't have it and yet it still rejects it it's very mm -hmm. strange mm -hmm. yeah well it's kind of like women who are pregnant and they're rh negative yep right mm -hmm. and their own body yep attacks the baby yep same kind of thing. We were just talking about that. That's why there yeah. was blood tests early in the like 1920s before people got married. Yeah. To determine if you have a, like if you're RH negative, RH positive, and you try to have a kid, it could be dangerous. Plus syphilis, but that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we all have a pretty um, intimate relationship with our bodies. I would say, and it's um, <laughs> it's. Uh, like we know them well, like we have experience and like we know where they, f you know, fail as we get older. And, um, and uh, yeah, like we have that experience. It's, it's like the closest biological system that we know, have firsthand experience with. And um, yeah, so uh, is there, is there any systems of the body that stand out to you as like super, uh, well designed or like that you may have heard of as like hey that's something that really be difficult to explain through evolutionary terms I don't know about difficult to explain but your brain is pretty cool yeah like you can give someone a fake limb and neuroplasticity kind of takes over and just makes it your own mm -hmm. you know and you figure out how to use it mm -hmm. yeah. or if you break something in your body that you your body can't fix we're smart enough to figure out how to make things to mm -hmm. fix our own body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The brain is highly complex. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, I think I put it in the email out that like, uh, uh, it was a quote. yeah, it was a quote. Um, I can't remember who, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke yep. that said, you know, the, the three pound mass in our heads is one of the most, organized and self-structured uh, pieces of matter in the universe that we know about um, and that's true like our brains are are you know we have some basic understanding on how they function with neurons firing and stuff like that but um, like deeper levels of like how consciousness works or even how like various parts of the brain interact with each other like e even like how our memories are stored is still an area of research. You know, it's not like a computer uh, system where it's like, oh, there's the hard drive that stores the data. Mm -hmm. There's the RAM that accesses it. Um, it's it's you know, there's obviously parts to it, but how those parts interact to form our the processing is 
pretty incredible and, and not fully understood. Unions Even the crazy well. things like dissociative identity, yeah. mm -hmm. like dreams. Mm -hmm. Dream, yeah. Dreams, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought the immune system was amazing because it's able to take in information like vaccines or when you get mm -hmm. ill. Mm -hmm. And like it is, you are introducing information to your body and your immune system is working through that in order to create what it needs to be a defense mechanism for that thing in the future. Yeah. Like the, like cold and flu um, evolve. Like every year it becomes something new. Um, not that the old ones die out, but like that's what viruses do. They're really good at it. Bacteria is really good at that. Or virus, sorry, more viruses. I don't know bacteria very well. But um, but when you in, like you're taking your body and you're introducing more information into it, and it's taking that instead of rejecting it, making you sick, which can happen. Side effects are real. Um, but for the majority, you take it in and your body decodes, like mm -hmm. figures out how to use it efficiently and then uses it for protection against something it's never experienced before. Yeah. Yeah, that's that the immune system, if you haven't dove into that, we'll talk about it a little bit more um, if we have time because mm -hmm. it, it is a fascinating one. Um, but the immune system is highly complex and has a lot of pieces to it and it's quite incredible in its engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've mentioned this term before in another class, but uh, there's a term called homeostasis. And homeostasis is this idea that the human body has to maintain a stable internal environment despite external and internal changes. Mm -hmm. It's essentially our built-in system for keeping things balanced. So like we have various external conditions that have to be managed. So let's take a, let's take a simple one. Uh, well, nothing's actually simple, but let's take a, uh, <laughs> an easy example of like temperature, right? Like, it, you know, we live in Iowa, it gets hot, it gets cold, um, and our bodies have to keep a certain balance, right? We need to be at um, 98.6 degrees. Good. And, give or take you know and, and our body is constantly trying to keep at that temperature despite it being negative 20 degrees outside or 100 degrees outside and there are multiple systems involved in regulating our temperature um, so we need a system to help cool us down when we're too hot and to warm us up when we're too cold and it's not just one, there's multiple strategies that the body uses as things get more and more extreme. Um, and if, if any of those fail, uh, you know, death is a consequence or a bad time at the very least. Uh, or permanent damage. <clears throat> or permanent damage, yeah. And you think about that, that's an, that is an engineering problem that we face with our machines. You know, I think about um, you know, the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. It's up in space. It has to have a homeostasis environment so that it can support the astronauts that are on there. And it needs to make sure that the, the, the space station stays at the right temperature so that the astronauts don't overheat. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, surprisingly, this is kind of maybe a side note, but, like, most people think that you would, like, freeze uh, before... Uh, you would, you know, if, if the space station went offline, you, th you would think the astronauts would freeze because space is cold, but they would actually probably overheat. Mm -hmm. um, it's because that space, while it's cold, it's a vacuum. And you think about how your um, uh, fancy Yeti mug keeps things hot or cold. It had, you know, a vacuum is a perfect insulation. There's not a lot of material there to transfer the heat. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you know, a spacesuit or a space station or a spaceship, that heat that the human body makes doesn't radiate out fast mm -hmm. enough. So and you end up with a heat problem, not a cooling problem. Um, side note for you today, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, like they're, they're challenging problems. And, and if it's an engineering thing, you need certain components and, and you see this for a lot of systems, right? You need a way to 
um, sense what's happening. You need sensors. So your body needs sensors to understand what temperature it's at. And there are various sensors throughout the body that give it information so that it can then make changes. And then those changes go into effect and let's say it's too cold outside and your body needs to warm up so it'll increase your metabolic rate, which will make you warmer. Or you shiver. Or you shiver. Um, and, or both probably. Um, so that system kicks on. Well, let's say you then go sit next to a fire. There needs to be uh, another system to say, hey, we're warming up. We need to cancel that like cold um, system that we turned on and we need to, you know, we need to, you know, chill that out and now maybe even go to like cooling down or something like that. Uh, and you, so you end up with these feedback systems. So feedback system is like a, a big idea in engineering um, where like you, you go to correct a change. You're like your home thermostat's a great example of this. The thermostat tries to keep it at the, at the temperature you set. So it kicks on the heat and it goes up and then it gets too far. So it turns off the heat and it starts going back down and then it kicks back on to go back up. Like your body does the same thing. It's this feedback mechanism of like knowing when to turn on the right systems and then when to turn them off so that you get into this very narrow range of compatibility. And furnaces have to get checked up every month so they don't break down and our bodies just do it till we die. Yeah. In potentially our 90s. Or yeah. If, if the sensor goes wrong and on your thermostat, then you're going to have trouble because it's going to not know what actual temperature it is and it'll stay on or stay off or whatever it may be. Um, and like temperature is just one of hundreds of factors that your body has to calibrate within a fine uh, zone. You think about, uh, well, maybe I'll throw it out as a question. What other systems can you think about that your body has to control? Mm -hmm. Waste management. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Acid get, production in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one oxygen saturation in your blood that's another great yep yeah, it's another great one ph ph balance yeah blood sugar blood sugar balance hormones hormone yep yeah. all of these things are all have to be within certain ranges um and when they're not you have since uh you have problems right like that's really what a doctor is doing it's like okay um their blood pressure is too high why is the body not correcting for that mm -hmm. or what is causing that you know and blood pressure is controlled by two major factors one is your cardiac um, cardiovascular system yeah, yeah your cardiac uh, cardiovascular system but like how fast your heart is beating and how much blood is pumping mm -hmm. and then also the resistance of your uh, veins mm -hmm. and so like there's there's friction in your brain uh, in your veins mm -hmm. and you know those two things cause can cause your blood pressure to go out of balance and you know what what is it which one is it and and they have to kind of make a judgment there you know is it like your veins are full of plaque so like it's hard to pump through uh, or, no. or are you yeah. stressed you don't so have that to change anything yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't have to correct behavior just take this pill yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, so yeah, like that's that's what that's the role of doctors quite quite often, um, and and all of these mechanisms have this this um, sweet zone, this Goldilocks zone that you need to be in, and the body has to uh, have the feedback mechanisms to keep it in there. And okay, let's think about this from a. Um, evolutionary standpoint what what makes that difficult to explain evolutionary wise like how, how do you like why would this be something that's hard to explain i mean it's it's that typical thing where like like what you said joshua which is the acid in your stomach let's say evolution worked all the way up into a creature of any kind that now has a stomach mm. and one day as that stomach is evolving that acid level is too high it dissolved the whole creature <laughs> um 
how does that creature then pass information along to say that acid was too high don't do it again yeah um on top of being able to there's so many systems that if we all know it like you get up one morning and you sneeze incorrectly and your whole body shudders because you've thrown your back out which then messes with your like digestion and like waste management because it hurts to sit on the potty now or whatever like there's just so much that can just go wrong that for it to go right yeah like it's a numbers game yeah it's a pure numbers game if something is going to survive and that complexity is intense how on earth did did it all work out it doesn't seem it just doesn't seem to be a thing that could feasibly happen a, a ton of times like so many times um there's too much failure involved that just ends it immediately yeah yeah i think you're yeah you hit on a lot of uh it was not very eloquent no but you hit on a lot of the main <laughs> ideas like there's a high number of dependencies mm -hmm. like within the system itself there's subsystems mm -hmm. and then each system has dependencies on other systems mm -hmm. and you have something that's not uh, correct in any of those and things fall apart you know that and, and like we see that even today with illnesses that throw off a system and then like that's it mm -hmm. you know like that's that's all it takes so like minor problems can cause um, catastrophic failures and it, it takes a very finely balanced and precision crafted uh, machine for it to work that way. You know, like that's why, you know, like our high technology world, it doesn't take much to mess up um, a computer, you know, like physically. Like if you drop it um, or, you know, uh, it gets wet. It gets wet, or like there, there's a lot of conditions that um, it can't handle, uh, and it doesn't have a way to recover from that. So they're ca catastrophic. You think of the gears in a watch. You know, you bend, you bend a single tooth in one of those gears, and the thing seizes. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes very little to to make it off. So like, all those pieces have to be there, and that gets back to the idea of irreducible complexity. Like it's it's just like the mousetrap. It needs every single one of those parts to work and function before it's effectively able to do its purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and our bodies are that times a, uh, a billion probably. Um, let's start talking about some of the specific systems in the body. Uh, one of the poster childs for irreducible complexity is the human eye. Mm -hmm. And um, it's said that we process about 80% of the information we process comes from our our vision um, so it's a pretty important uh, part of our existence um, and um, but the eye is very complex it has many many different specialized cells that are not used anywhere else in the body um, you know, I think there, it's probably like five or six different types of cells. You got the rod cells and the, um, the cone cells, and um, the uh, there's many more that have um, various names. But um, they they all have to be in just the right way for vision to work. And you need you need a lens to focus the vision onto the retina. Um, and you need uh, the cornea to protect the eye um, because it's a sensitive organ. You need muscles and um, uh, a structure to hold all of these things together um, so that you can look around. Um, and even probably one of the hardest things to explain is, um, so you have all of these cells in, the, in your retina that are photosensitive and when light when a photon comes in and hits uh, like a rod or a cone, that deforms that cell, which then causes an electrical signal to go to your brain. And you have you know, millions of these cells in your eye that then 
it, your brain is getting all of this information, but your brain has to know what to do with that information, right? Because that, you know, that that's just raw information. That's just electrical signals. Um, and if you don't have a, a brain to interpret that signal, then it's not helping you at all, right? And you know, your brain does a lot for your vision, you know, so much so that like you know like our vision is upside down and backwards and your brain corrects for that mm -hmm. you have a blind spot where your optical nerve in meets your your retina and like you don't see that your brain like Doesn't photoshops it yeah. um <laughs> which is crazy that your brain does that like your your brain is like a you know it's 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 fascinating how much it corrects for um and like you know there's always those like little tricks you can do to kind of exploit your eyes uh, um, biases and um, I can't remember any off the top of my head but you know like there's a way you can like hold your thumb out and like go, go it like disappears because your brain has no um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> holding your fingers out yeah um, but yeah like like processing that information is is quite uh, taxing um, and like it just is automatic. Like you're not thinking about it, right? You're not like, oh, I need to run that process so I can interpret the visual information coming from my eye. It just happens. Mm -hmm. Only oh. if it works well. For it, anyone that wears working. contacts or glasses, you know what happens when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and like the... the um, so evolutionary like so since this is a poster child for uh irreducible complexity there's a lot of uh, ideas on how the eye could evolve and, and i think we've touched on this in the past but you know uh, evolutionary um proponents will say you know it probably started out as a, a cluster of light sensitive cells like very simple and those came from where? You know, they 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 <laughs> they came from random mutations. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it was a luck of the draw. You now got some because light luck sensitive. Is real. Yeah. Yeah. You got some light sensitive <laughs> photons, and that helps you. Um, you know, you you can't really see anything, but you can like sense that it's brighter over here than it is over here, and so like you know if you're looking for if you're an organism that's looking to eat algae you might want to go towards the light because light is also what makes algae grow so you're more likely to find food mm -hmm. and then you know as you evolve you get some more changes and maybe you develop um, <clears throat> like a cornea over that so that you know it protects it better because you know your relatives uh, went blind pretty quickly uh, but you have that cornea, so now you're more likely to reproduce. And then you get uh, more, uh, you get a bunch of these uh, mutations that then specialize the cells, and um, that's kind of how you do it. And, you know, I think that sounds plausible, but is that, like, that's a possibility on how it could happen, but what are the evidences for that to happen? I mean they're, that they're, little brain cell that grew a little blueberry pancake. That's, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying it did it. But however, is that evolutionary or is exactly that yeah. because it's like I, reading through that, I would be <coughs> curious to know because I haven't seen much since we talked about it the last month. But uh, how did they determine that they were functioning and pulling in information and not like tumors? Yeah. Right? They're like, look, eyeballs. So it's like, okay, cool. Are you sure? Like, what are they doing? Um, but yeah, what were, what was there? There would have to be information in there. It wasn't an evolutionary thing because they were like, look, brain cells, boom, eyeballs. There was no time, like mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years for that brain to figure it out, to, for those cells to determine now we need eyeball cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. They just were there. Yeah, and, and I think that also, I mean, I would even argue that the fact that those um, neurons that were basically incubated mm -hmm. 
started growing eyes shows that the eyes Mm -hmm. in the brain are highly connected and are fundamentally part of what Mm -hmm. brains need. Yeah. Like our brains need to process and experience the reality we live in and it's like fundamentally baked into the Mm -hmm. what makes a brain a brain is it needs sensory input why would an organ (coughs) need anything i can't hear any of this without asking like yeah but why what you know like Mm -hmm. what's what's, right what drives it right i mean like survive i mean survival i don't know of too many people like really like you really i don't know yeah yeah i mean i think that's a and, and I think how evolutionary science would have to answer that is there is no why. It's just random accidents mm-hmm. that help you survive. Like the why is no longer a relevant question. Mm-hmm. Te- like teleology, which is like like the purpose of things, um, like there is basically a useless area to go down because there is no purpose to anything. Mm-hmm. And like that's why you hear some scientists call us like fleshy robots because yeah. we're that's. That's basically how they see us. Um, they see themselves. They yeah. see, we're just accidental <coughs> machines that are biological in nature that really have no purpose um, except to, you know, survive is maybe the only... Right, but the, yeah, I mean, that's still, like, still drives down to the... That's still... That's like, still a why. why do we want to... You st- can't escape strive. a why yeah. of, like, well, survival. It's like, okay, well, that's still a why. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the teleology of it is still relevant because you're still, like, whether you want to admit it or not, there's still a why. It doesn't yeah. have to be necessarily transcendent, but it still exists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It? yeah, and I think if you keep pushing, I think they would end up saying that um, the why is because we exist. Like, it's almost circular logic, mm-hmm. you know, where, yeah, like... Um, like I, you know, I think this not only applies to life, but also just the universe in itself. Like, we just happen to find ourselves in the series of events that led to our existence. Mm-hmm. And, like, there's no why behind it. It's just we happen to be in that. And that's why they lean towards, like, uh, even that we're like multi-universe happen. stuff. Mm-hmm. And, like, they need a ton of chances. And it's just like, oh, this is just... We're here because you roll the dice enough times, and yeah. things just happen the way they happen. Right. You know, and that's what you have to come down to. And, and right, it's not a satisfying answer at all, right. because like that like, goes well, against. I didn't know that chance and happen and luck were actual forces in the universe that mm-hmm. accomplish anything. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I don't. Was it John Lennox that said it? I can't remember. Somebody said it. Probably wasn't him. Anyway, um, for that materialistic mindset of like, well, we're all just. What do they call it? Like meat bags with like hormone Mm. electrons bouncing around in our brains. And that's all we are. Um, The next question was like, then why should I trust anything you're saying? Like if you're, (laughs) if what's happening up here is just electrons bouncing around to keep this meat bag alive. And you're telling me how that is. Why should I trust what's Mm. like these random sparks in your brain? Like that doesn't, like your logic doesn't come to a like to a appropriate conclusion from your own perspective, which I was like, Oh, that makes sense. Like that's a, that's a decent, not necessarily argument, but just observation for that kind of mindset. And I think that they just ignore it. (laughs) They're just like, no, thank you. You're like, okay, you're dumb. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, you just don't understand. It's like, sounds like we both don't understand, but okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the eyes are complex. But, you know, it doesn't stop there. Um, our ears are arguably just as complex mm-hmm. um, in, in our hearing. So ears, uh, the shape of our ears is important. Um, like the various folds and, you know, sh- structure of ears helps us determine uh, the direction of sound. Because the sound waves pass through your ears in different uh, way, like, you know, and where it's thinner, it passes through easier. Where it's thicker, it doesn't. And your brain interprets that and like does some fancy algorithm, apparently, that helps you detect the direction of the sound. Um, not only that, our brains are capable of distinguishing w- within like very fine, like very short amount of time. The the difference in like. My left ear will hear Josh before my right ear does, and it'll then conclude that it came from that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Our ear structure is has you know the three smallest bones in the human body, and those tiny little bones in your ear translate um, air vibrations into your inner ear, which then um, is more f it's fluid based, so it, it like hits the drum and then uh, that uh, moves the fluid in your ear um, to then go past all those little tiny hairs that then get vibe like each tiny little hair is just the right length for a certain frequency so when the frequency hits the little hair in your ear uh, for lack of a better term like that triggers a certain frequency of sound and then your brain interprets that as hearing um, and that's just an oversimplified version of how you hear uh, like some interesting things about the ear as well those three little bones in your uh, ear they do not grow like when you're born they are the same size as when you die um, and like that's the only part of your body that doesn't grow how did that evolve Right? Like, how do those three bones know not to grow when every part of the rest of your body knows it, like, grows? It's on, like, we don't know. Um, it evolved perfectly the first time. Yeah. No changes needed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It reminds me when someone said that words are just wiggly air. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's 100% true. We're just interpreting wiggly air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's whatever, a means of communication. When our eyeballs are just converting light bouncing off of other things. We're not actually seeing anything, we're seeing the light bouncing off of it. We're seeing the weird. A, a small mm. fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum yeah. and interpreting it as visual information. Wild. Mm. What is reality? Next class. <coughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's that's philosophy. <laughs> Sorry. And we'll get into that at another well, that's point. When you talked about like the blind spot mm -hmm. in our eye, it's mm -hmm. like then that begs the question of like, well then if that's true that there is that mm -hmm. blind spot if your brain is photoshopping it, then how can you trust that what yeah. You know, what do you see? It's like right. well, this testimony is not. The yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. How yeah, much of like, your senses can you really trust? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a interesting. That's question. when Jesus says, "Bring more people to the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't just yeah. be by yourself. Yeah. Bring yeah. one or two of, or two or three of you." Mm. But oh. it's also ridiculous. Like, yeah, you can go down that. Way. Mm -hmm. What is truth? And what, what is, is reality? It's like, uh, whatever. <laughs> we, on the way, You're 1600s philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> on the way here, I was talking to Charles. Once we finish through some of this stuff, I'd actually like to move into philosophy. Mm -hmm. And and there's a great Nate's course like, that I'm I instructing. Not no, no, no. I know. I know. I, I, know. Love it. I know. Yeah. Um, you know, like talking about the various Western philosophers mm -hmm. and like what mm -hmm. the various ideas they've had over time and how that's changed. I think that'd be a really interesting mm -hmm. thing to dive into. Yeah. Yeah. Very well, just bring chamomile tea so we all leave like oh yeah, everything's yeah. okay yeah. everything is okay we'll have to end with uh, a ray of hope after yes. everyone we will get existential dread okay. um, we all leave and we're like nothing is worth it anymore yeah. <laughs> especially if we talk about Nietzsche no but, oh gosh um, mm -hmm. so another interesting aspect of human life in, in mo most well actually not most life um, reproduction so most life is cellular in nature, bacteria and stuff like that. And they um, reproduce in a process called mitosis, mm -hmm. which is a pretty complex process within itself where the cell has to create an exact copy of itself and copy its DNA and structures and then it divides, which is an incredibly complex orchestration of events. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in mitosis. And that's actually where a lot of, um, if I remember correctly, a lot of antibacterial or antibiotics, um, they mess with the mitosis yep. functions because it's a it's an area of vulnerability. Um, I think a lot of them mess with the cell walls. Mm -hmm. So when, when the cell is dividing, it has to um, keep uh, homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. But it's dividing. So how do you keep... How do you separate and keep homeostasis? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the cell wall, and there's a lot of complex biochemistry that happens to enable that without this, both the cells dying. Mm -hmm. um, and antibiotics, a lot of times, mess with that process, or the cell wall fails, and then the, both cells die, and you can't get reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in, in evolutionary terms, bacteria and single cell organisms are more simple, and we evolved from those. 
So why did sexual reproduction happen? Mm -hmm. um, what is the advantages of sexual reproduction from an evolutionary standpoint? Genetic diversity. Yep, yep. Uh, genetic diversity. <coughs> Excuse me. Meiosis versus mitosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good terminology. So like, yeah, genetic diversity, um, genome repair. So like if there's um, errors in the genome, uh, then like uh, it can be corrected through, you know, joining two together. What are the difficulties or like why? Um, if you think about it, like why, what's the advantages other than that? Like how does a cell get to the point where it has a counterpart cell that it joins with, shares information, combines that DNA to create a unique thing? I mean, usually that turns into cancer in our yeah. bodies. Like that doesn't usually end well. Yeah, like how did the first meiosis cell begin, right? Like you needed that, you really needed the counterpart to evolve at the exact same time and then mm -hmm. them find each other mm -hmm. and then it go forward. Mm -hmm. Like that seems difficult to say the least. Mm -hmm. Does that happen in asexual reproduction? I wonder. <clears throat> I, so yeah, most. Most, so there's only a few examples of asexual reproduction in nature, and I'd have to look into it in detail. But I, th I think what happens is those animals end up um, having both sides of the equation and like just happening within its own body. Um, it, it's, I think it's still a uh, meiosis, like meiosis thing but just within itself um but i could be wrong i'd have to look into that more i think that's usually the case and it's inter like there was a uh i don't i think it was late last year there was an article that popped out and like i i think a few and i don't think it went very far but a few evolutionary like hurrah people were like see look it's happening it's right there um there was a mammal at a zoo I think it was a monkey. It could have been a panda. I'm not sure. I know it was a mammal that got pregnant. It had been in its cage all by itself for years, years and years and years and years all alone. And then they went to check in on it one day and it was pregnant. They're like, what in the world? So they were like, look, it's happening. Like, like mammals are evolving to get pregnant all by themselves. And it turns out they're, this is gonna sound so inappropriate, but it's what happened. There was a hole between cages mm -hmm. and she got pregnant by the male creature mm -hmm. next door. And they just were like, can't it, it, instead of jumping to rational conclusion of like, we know how the female mammal gets pregnant. It doesn't happen by itself. They literally jumped right to it when like right next door <laughs> was like the male counterpart and they were like, there's no way, there's just no way. And it turns out, yeah, someone figured it out. Life found a way. Always does. Yep. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's, there's a, a way. <laughs> that, but like that article popped out and it was, mm -hmm. I followed it for a while because I was like, there's no way, there's no way. And they were like, look, it's amazing. It's a miracle. It's wonderful. And they were like, ah, dang. Nope. It was just the same old, same old. I was like, guys, guys, wait and see, wait and see. There's got to be rational explanation for it. And there was. Yeah, so like one of the challenges for evolutionary science is it's double the effort with half the offspring. Yep. So you think about that, like from an evolutionary standpoint, the goal is reproduction, just the, to reproduce your genes going forward. Well, now that you have sexual reproduction, you're only passing forward half your genes. Mm -hmm. And you need all of this special equipment to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not efficient for copying your genes. Mm -hmm. uh, beneficial mutations get diluted. So um, as you know, evolution is happening, you get, um, you know, let's use the eye example. You get a creature that randomly got a cluster of light sensitive cells. Great, it reproduces with one that doesn't mm -hmm. have that because it happened once because it's a 
freak mutation. Um, now that offspring, the offspring is, you know, that that special tweak is getting diluted, mm -hmm. and the offspring may or may not have those that that mutation. You look at color blindness. It's a male trait <clears throat> that yeah. gets passed from the male gene. Like that's not beneficial to be colorblind. Sexist trait. Totally is. Unfortunately. Uh, actually, there is some benefit to being colorblind. Uh, technically, so when you're colorblind, you actually sense motion better. So they say it's actually advantageous for hunting. That's why a lot of carnivores are colorblind, like dogs. Mm -hmm. um, it helps them see motion and focus on that versus um, color, which helps. But if give you're more a human. Right in a society where color is quite beneficial, such as mm -hmm. if I eat that tree frog that's very brightly colored or that mushroom that's the wrong color, I'm going to die. So color seems to be extremely important for the human species. Yeah. And yet we continuously pass on a garbage trait. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So sexual reproduction for <coughs> humans doesn't seem to be as beneficial if you're looking at it from beneficial mutations yep. getting diluted. Yeah. And we were more animalistic and got rid of the offspring yeah. that had non-beneficial traits. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't keep passing them on. Potentially, yeah. Just, just, but, just hold on. We're getting there. But <laughs> for that to happen, you would have to raise them long enough to teach them language to determine that they're not seeing colors appropriately and you've wasted resources on that child up until maybe age, what, four or five. So even then, that's not so even beneficial. Down syndrome. Eat them. Right, right away. <laughs> I don't like eating Well, I mean, and, and that is a interesting side effect. So if you take, um, so if you're an evolutionary scientist, um, eugenics becomes almost a conclusion. Like, a, like, like if you're going to be consistent in your thinking and how things go, yep. you're going to lean more towards a eugenics program. But very few uh, evolutionists do because of the morality of it. It's, it's. There's something like written on their hearts or something that keeps them Weird. from doing that. Weird. Um, but you know, you see it in history, mm -hmm. like uh, the Nazi regime. Like they were like, yeah, eugenics. Like, I mean, the United States did it. The, <laughs> you know, just the Nazis. <laughs> the <laughs> the it's <laughs> true. They were just more subtle. <laughs> the founders of Planned Parenthood. It goes. Yeah. It goes objective. back further than that, though. Like Romans, like like Christian during during the Roman Empire, like if they had a weak child, if the if a Roman mother gave birth to a child and that child seemed weak or was female for that matter, they would just set it outside and wait for the elements to kill the baby because it was it was weak. And it was Christian individuals that would come around and rescue them. Yeah. And like that's kind of where some some informal adopt like that Christian I don't know. Anyway, historical stuff. But even then, like it just simply was you're not useful. And it wasn't politically minded. It was simply they were like, "You're not, you're not a person. You're a resource taker, and you're not beneficial to us. We'll just put you outside. Let nature take its course." Yes, yeah. I mean, it, 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 when you logically conclude, if you logically conclude that humanity is just flesh robots, right. then the value of life is meaningless, right. and you might as well make it strong so it can survive. Divorce shouldn't um, be an option. You should just be able to get rid of your spouse. Well, or child. I mean, if you I mean, if you point. keep if you keep moving it forward, like you don't even pick your spouse, right? Like you like, just it, it's like, it go, it's like cattle breeding at that point, right? You know, like just pass along genetic music, yeah, information and move on. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's um, morally like difficult things when you start saying that humans are nothing more than accidental Is creations. It Peter Singer is that his name? Yeah. Peter Singer. Yeah. Read his stuff if you wonder what people think. Yeah, so Peter Singer, he's a, he's a, I think he calls himself a philosopher, but yes. he he has some interesting thoughts. Um, he's consistent. He he's someone who is consistent in his thinking, but has a non-Christian outlook. So he basically, like on abortion, he he says abortion is um, silly yeah. because there's there's no difference between. Uh, like what is passing? I think the way he phrases what is passing through the cervix do right. to a baby that makes them a human being? Right. Um, but instead of saying, "Hey, that's a that's a reason why not to have abortion," he says, "Let's take it further. Mm -hmm. Like if that child is not wanted after birth, 
infanticide. Yeah. Like, or he, he, he or supports infanticide. Or yeah. like a two year old, a four year old, if at any point in time that because it's wanted. And what is a wanted individual? Probably someone that is contributing <clears throat> to society or to your family in a beneficial way. When does a kid actually do that? Past their parents just being like, you just bring me fulfillment. They bring no money. They take resources. They take sleep. They, t- they take for a very long time. And so if at any point in time that becomes too much for a, an adult to bear, then, then getting rid of that child at any point should be acceptable yeah because there's nothing beneficial about them until they either can breed or bring money or bring resource like it's just the logical conclusion if life is not important and it's all about fulfilling society's need for x y and z yeah as morally objectable as i am with his conclusions yeah (coughs) i actually respect his um view more just because he's consistent in his thinking yeah like he's not Del- delusionally saying that there's something different with a baby inside and outside because you know a lot of um, a lot of times people will say well a baby is dependent on its mother when it's in the womb right. a baby is dependent on its mother when it's outside the womb Correct. like a baby is not going to survive without their mother uh, or a care- caretaker it's still fully dependent like nothing has changed from it being inside to out mm-hmm. um, and he's like you know he just has the opposite conclusion mm-hmm. is saying that like life doesn't have meaning in itself life only has meaning for those like we give things meaning so if no one is wanting them then you know yep. why not euthanasia absolutely yeah. yes because at what point are you no longer wanted by society even yeah. when you've lived your whole life yeah you're just a drain on the system right yeah yep. yeah it gets super complicated and like you know thank god that he put morality on our hearts because if he hadn't i think those eugenics and all like it would have like nothing would have stopped it but you know that moral well you look at china and the one child law like what does that look like when it plays out even even just in in childhood right because during that time and they're they're reaping the consequences unfortunately of that now where there's not enough women for all of the single men and those women are not wanting to have babies and blah, 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 blah. But during that time, they were like, you can have one child. And it was only beneficial to have a son. So all of those female babies, they were killed or they were hidden or they were hurt in terrible ways or thrown into orphanage, et cetera. And, and it's from a place of like life, life's not important. And these babies must have purpose and purpose was like having an heir and that heir would have to be a man, a, a boy, like, ooh, it's intense, but you can see how that plays out. And there's other societies from historical past where if we dig deep enough, you can see like what happens. Like we're not the first society to have these conversations and thoughts and then to do something with them. No, I mean, I think our- That's our, when you said that. No, but. our society today is moving more towards a pagan. Yeah mindset religion without yeah. knowing it yeah um, in a lot of ways yeah. but Oof. that's a that's another topic again um so we talked a little bit about the cardiovascular system but there's a lot going there right like there there is a lot you know blood is associated with life for good reason um and the heart is a key component of our bodies and it's has historically always been known to that, for that <laughs> Um, the heart actually, you know, so it's made of muscle, but it, it's a unique kind of muscle um, that has a special clump of cells that um, triggers the uh, atria to contract. So, like, there's a clump of there's a clump there's a special area of cells in the heart that controls the heart rate, basically. Um, and there's like, yeah, yeah. Um, Exactly, and that that is unique to the heart, and um, is critical for regulating blood pressure and making sure the body has the 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 blood pumping through it. Um, I think we have something like sixty thousand miles of veins for um, for our hump to pump through body. I think that's the I think that's what I read. I didn't note it down. But it's, 
it's a lot. Whatever the specific number is, it's a lot. Um, 60,000. Yeah, 60,000 miles of veins in our bodies that our heart has to pump blood to, which is just incredible when you think about it. Um, one of the interesting things um, that I found is, so iron is key to latching onto oxygen in, in the lungs ca uh, capillaries, right? Uh, iron is what carries oxygen in the blood throughout the body. The problem, though, is iron is toxic when it's present in the uh, in the body freeform. Like if you just have iron floating through your body, um, that's toxic and can kill you. So uh, what happened? Um, you know, design or evolved, or you know, you be the judge is hemoglobin, which is a special protein was specially created in red blood cells to capture and hold on to iron so that it doesn't freely float throughout the body. And it's a very uh, structured protein that has a very uh, clear, um, uh, you know, f shape so that it can hold on to iron so that then that iron can grab onto the oxygen and you have this hemoglobin with iron and oxygen, and then that can take it throughout the body. So you think about how does hemoglobin evolve? Because you know there's this problem with iron being toxic. Um, so life couldn't have used, like you couldn't have had blood working the way we know it works without hemoglobin. So then how do you oxygenate the body? <coughs> you get this, uh, quickly you get this chicken and egg problem and that, you know, there's not a good answer to. Um, so another challenge for our cardiovascular system is we are not static beings. So we move around and activity, we do activity, you know, and uh, when we start um, stressing our bodies with running or moving around or whatever it might be, we need more oxygen. So the system has to uh, move up and you, you kind of get this feedback loop thing again, right? Where like as you increase your activity, you need to have higher O2 demands and there are sensors in the body that, that uh, measure O2 levels and res have the body respond to that so that it all continues to work despite having more of a strain. Um, and not only that, like our body position changes the, <coughs> like pressure. So like if you hold your hand up in the air, your heart has to work a tiny bit harder mm -hmm. to pump blood up there. Um, you know, if you, if you invert yourself, you know, blood kind of rushes to your head, but it doesn't like kill you, uh, because your body has control mechanisms for that. Mm -hmm. So like just the way your body is moving throughout space affects how your cardiovascular system responds. Um, something that we just take for granted every day. Um, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, immune system. So Charles talked about this. Sorry about that. Didn't know you were going to talk about that. No, it's okay. It's, it's okay. I should read your notes ahead of time. <laughs> uh, the immune system is uh, amazing, and, and I probably can't do it justice. Um, I'd have to like honestly, we could probably talk about the immune system for a whole class uh, because it's it's so interesting. Um, one of the things that makes it interesting is there's layered defenses to your immune system. It's not just a single defense mechanism, but we have, um, so we have what they call innate immunity, which is a fast nonspecific response. So this is what kicks in like when you cut yourself and you know, you're now, uh, your homeostasis is threatened because your skin is breached and bacteria can get in or anything can get in. And blood can fall out. And blood can fall out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, it's a weird way to say it, but that, that is how... That's what it, happens. Yeah, it is. Um, so it needs to do something about that. So the immune system is responsible for 
um, attacking the invaders that come in. Like if you cut every time you cut yourself, bacteria is getting into your body, and your your immune system just takes care of it most of the time. Like no problems, just. And it's not like you warn it ahead of time. Like I'm going to cut myself on like this knife that has E. coli. Be prepared. It just comes at it with everything it needs and is like, it doesn't matter what comes in, it's ready with something. Yeah. Like that's wild. That's insane to me. Yep. And so you have like this fast response immunity and then you have more of adaptive immunity. It's slower, but it becomes more highly specific mm -hmm. um, and it creates targeted antibodies and memory cells, which is a whole topic within itself. but. It's where like our immunity actually grows and gets smarter. Um, and so you're saying go eat dirt. <laughs> yeah, I mean it will go help your. I mean it will as long as it doesn't take you out, it'll make you stronger. Sure. I guess. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So your immune system has different types of. Um, I mean, you can think of it as an army. And there's different types of specialized units in that army. You have your, your front line, you know, t uh, white blood cells that kind of act quickly and are more of a generic solution. Um, but then you have bacteria that outsmart those white blood cells. So then your body has to take a look at it from a more specialized point of view. And that's where your body, uh, I mean, I'm kind of broad stroking this it's more complicated than i'm making it out to be uh, but you have b cells that basically are like scouts that say i think this is correct they, they go out and they <coughs> like analyze the enemy take it back and that helps inform your body to create um antibodies and then the t cells go out and direct attack against the other cells like it's it's phenomenally complex and amazing. Um, maybe we can email out the video. Yes, that's such a good video. Um, there's, there's a ser it's a series of videos that yep. talk about this in detail. And they're kind of fun to watch because they're animated. But uh, it goes into bit better details to not. And it's, it's, it's just like jaw-droppingly mm -hmm. crazy how well your body does this. And um, I think it was from one of those videos. Like apparently your body has everything it needs mm -hmm. to defeat any anything anything it's the problem is can I'm your body your emails. yes um, it's me it's it, the question is like can your body respond quick enough mm -hmm. and like and can fast. it figure it out fast enough can it find the solution right and big enough i mean like just because right. we have the capacity to f defeat you know mercury like if you drink, yeah. if you drink a gallon of it, like yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, right, you're, yeah. If your body is overwhelmed, you yeah. you can't make enough of the you can't like it's a it's a soldier problem, right? You gotta treat it like iocane powder. And do really yeah. small increments yeah. to yeah. build up an immunity. Yeah, yeah, and that's where the first vaccinations came from. Basically, is is that? Um, yeah, and then like your body uh, remembers specific antibodies that are useful for fighting specific bacteria and infections so like the next time you get it it's not a big deal you know like chicken pox you know you get it first and then you got it and your body figures out how to deal with chicken pox and now you're good um like that is um yeah like that's or how a mom passes it in breast milk to the yeah. baby yeah it's wild it's unbelievable Unbelievable. Yeah, the memory cells basically can provide a faster, stronger response in the next time you face that same challenger. Um, yeah, and you and, and it's it is a war, like it is a microscopic war. Like there are bacteria and viruses and um, pathogens like that want to destroy, like want to reproduce. Use your body to reproduce and to to live out its life cycle. Um, and your body is creating a counterattack for that. And most of the time, like, it just does it. And, you know, I would say, I don't know if there's numbers on this, but most of the time your body doesn't even react to those things. Like, you don't even notice it. 
um, you know, there are things where like you do end up noticing it when you get like the flu and stuff like that and you start getting symptoms, um, but then your body conquers it then too. It's, it's, it's incredible. It, it's, it, I don't know. It, I came across this recently within the past couple of years and it just like it was one of those jaw dropping things where I was like wow that is way more complex and intricate than I thought it was medicine is so cool <coughs> excuse me um, the last the last thing I wanted to cover um, today with the body and like literally you could pick any body part and discover something amazing about it um, like we went to a conference a couple years ago and someone was uh, talking about the human foot and how incredible it is and like how it's, yeah foot and ankle like how optimized it is for the what we do um, like three points of contract uh, contact and then like how it flexes and like how it's just engineered perfectly for what we do and we don't even think about it um, so yeah, like every single body part has amazing things about it. But another one that's kind of stood out to me is uniquely interesting for the purposes of, uh, you know, evidences for design is the cl uh, clotting cascade. So this is similar to immunity, but a bit different. Like when you injure yourself or cut open your skin, your body has to still like you, you. You don't want to. You don't want all your blood to fall out. Don't so let your blood to, fall out. It needs to. <laughs> it needs to clot. Um, the problem is uh, excessive clotting within blood vessels can block circulation, causing strokes and heart attacks. So your body needs a mechanism to stop bleeding, but not too much where it causes clots, um, and that is a huge like hard balance and that is not fully understood on how our bodies can clot the right amount in the right place with Sorry. the right efforts okay. um, so we have you know platelets that are small cell fragments that stick to injuries um, and are released when our body releases the clotting signals well, the it's I mean, the blood pulling out thing. Mm -hmm. Just making me think about like, and then the even though it's all integrated, yet there's the separation because like when the blood does fall out, it's not like you can't just be like, oh, well, I'll just put it know, back put in. The, yeah, like I'll just <laughs> ingest that, and mm -hmm. then it's fine because it's yeah. back in there. Yeah. Like, Bad oh, day. Wait, no, that doesn't work that way. Vampires no. don't exist for a reason. Yeah. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, our, our body detects damage and then proteins are released in the blood. They create a cascade <coughs> reaction to, to help that clot form. But then we have anti-clotting proteins that limit the clotting and break down clots as healing occurs. Because well, it has hemophiliac. Right, right. That's, that's where a bad day. that's where things go wrong. Um, like there like this is such a balanced thing that there are uh, terrible diseases where where clotting goes wrong either one way or the other way um so if you if you have if you if you don't have um uh the correct anti-clotting proteins um or they're not as effective as they should your risk of uh, a clot and heart attack are extremely high um, and you're probably on blood thinners and stuff like that we have that in our family it's a female genetic uh, disorder that gets passed down through the female line. It's called Factor Five because I had to get tested for it. My cousin couldn't have babies anymore because she was clotting like crazy, and they tested and she has Factor Five, so she clots too much, and so when she gets pregnant, she loses the baby because she clots and it doesn't allow for. It's wild. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's just one. Like that's just one small genetic. Mm -hmm potential breakdown in that yeah. it's wild yeah and i think one of the interesting things about clotting is like it has to have a f positive feedback loop right like not every injury is equal so mm -hmm. your body has to recognize what is the extent of this damage and then have the appropriate response clotting response if it doesn't you're going to have problems uh, and like it doesn't have a lot of time to figure it out like like if you cut yourself 
um, in the right way and you're bleeding significantly, the body has to amp that clotting up quickly um, or you're, or you're going to bleed out. Um, and like balancing that and like how does your – how and, and we're not talking about like a – you're not consciously doing any of this, right? There's no – there's no uh, – it's all automatic and um there's no directive like it's not like you look at your injury and like oh that's bad and tell your clotting system to like ramp it up like these cells have mechanisms built into themselves to um amplify and create a positive feedback loop and say okay this isn't enough this isn't enough this isn't enough and and escalate that up and then as soon as it gets to the right level it's like okay back down back down back down um and like it's it's extremely uh there's it's extremely low failure point yeah like yeah. it just has to be right on that balance can cannot be off um and like there's there's many uh Kind of like the immune system, there's many layers to uh, clotting mechanisms, like uh, like where and how and what the damage is, and then like there's anti uh, coagulants in the blood that help with these things. It, it's a uh, yeah, it's a really interesting problem for evolutionary explanations because <clears throat> how do you get a system that successfully does this clotting cascade when there's such fine tolerances for it to be functional um any you know these proteins these these clotting proteins and anti-proteins need to both be there uh to effectively ha have an effective clotting system uh and, and it just makes me think like wait you know clotting is amazing immunity is amazing uh how are like all of these systems are incredibly important. How do they, like, where are all the failures, right? I think is where it comes down to. Like, if, if life evolved, there had to have been so many failures before something worked correctly. Um, you know, and I think you know, evolutionary biologists would argue with that and say, well, yeah, I mean, you got genetic diseases, you have genetic mutations that cause horrible things, and then, you know, they can't reproduce, and, you know. But <coughs> these codependent systems having to have these mutations basically at the same time that are, that are, that work together to form a system, like, that takes planning ahead. It takes engineering. Um, that's why we don't see clocks of coming out of nature. That's why we don't see advanced machinery just happening. Um, or, you know, going back to another class, that's why we don't see uh, your name written in the sand on the beach, like, on accident. Like, the, the, it's just not something nature does on its own. And we have to engineer solutions to these problems and create the feedback loops and the sensors. and systems by their very nature are dependent on the piece before it so what arguments do like the evolutionary biologists what do they point to as evidence for i mean are they looking at like the fossil record or are they looking at I mean, how, yeah. do they, how do they even get there mm -hmm. yeah i think there's a couple of things and and that's a good segue to uh, uh to, you know advocate for next month because some of the arguments are like our bodies are actually poorly designed. Um, That's right. That's and um, maybe yours is. No, no kidding. Have <laughs> you so, yeah. been to a doctor? Sometimes it feels that way. Uh, but like, I'm gorgeous. Right. I am perfect. <laughs> but you have things like um, you know the term vestigial organs or um, things that are like you know the the. Um, like the pancreas? Yeah, the pancreas. Or no, no sorry, no, the no, appendix. The appendix. And tonsils. Tonsils. Yeah, you don't really need those. They're leftover. Um, you know, like if we were really well engineered, we wouldn't have X, Y, Z problem. Um, and there's quite a few of those poor, like, if things are truly designed, then they should be designed well. Mm -hmm. um, and how do, how do we answer that? Well, I think soon. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Um, but I think there's other 
counter arguments and, and we'll talk through what those you know what those things are that they say are poorly designed and then is there actually function there is it actually fully optimized for the two different uh, goals like when you're solving design problems or engineering problems um, maybe I'm foreshadowing too much but like you have to create a balance between two competing factors like usually like a lot of times there's not a solid single um, this is the this is the this has all the pros and none of the cons um, you have to find that balance that that between those factors and we see a lot of that in these arguments but we're going to go into that more more in more depth and you mentioned the fossil record we're also going to talk about that in the future um, so yeah there's there's quite a few things that they would say um, I, you know I think the real question is like I, and I've said this before like you can have plausible explanations, but is there evidences for them? Um, and I think that's kind of what it comes down to. They have a lot of plausible explanations, but no direct evidence to back up those explanations. Um, at least not currently. They're they're trying, um, and maybe they'll find answers for some of it. But you know, until uh, until they can uh, have answers for all of it, like. It, it there's a, even if they had answers for all it doesn't mean that it wasn't designed um, for those purposes so yeah we'll be talking about that in more detail any other thoughts as we close up no great <laughs>